Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Granada Forum on March 5th, 2009. Tonight we have a very special guest with us who's come back many times to the Granada Forum, and we're very grateful. What is going on in America is an absolute travesty and the scariest thing I can possibly imagine. This man uh, was an FBI for 27 years, was a bureau chief of LA County for seven and a half. He's going to be talking about current events and some incredible stories. Let's give him a warm round of applause for Mr. Ted Gunderson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you. I've got a sticker on the back of my pickup right outside. And it says, for those who fought for it, freedom has a special flavor the protected will never know. And I, I, every once in a while, somebody comes up behind me and honks somewhere. And also, on the other side of my bumper, I said, bring back the boys from Vietnam. We left our boys in Vietnam. That's how much the government cares about our veterans and about the rest of us here in this country. They could care less. The bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., we have a bunch of criminals running the government, and I'm going to go into it in detail tonight. By the way, my brother uh, was 21 years old, was shot down over Germany, B-24, and he tried to get in the Navy, and he flunked his physical because he had a human. Went on a special diet, applied for the Air Force, got in the Air Force, he ended up uh, giving his life to his country. He was a young, patriotic guy like the rest of us. I'm still patriotic. I, I love my country, and I hate to see it what's happened to us here today. I've got a, uh, I, I have a special report on my table back here. And I want everybody here to take a copy of it. And it's, I put out a monthly intelligence report. And this is the report for March. And I'll just go through very briefly with you. Before I do that, though, let me just mention, uh, Wendy wanted me to introduce myself. Uh, I was, well, I'll go into that after this report. Um, anyway, uh, I start out in this intelligence report with an introduction, and then I go into the shadow government, and I call it the covert government criminal enterprise, which is what it is. And then I give a lot of details on that, and uh, this uh, uh, report explains how they operate, how uh, they're keeping track of all of us, and uh, what's happening back in Washington, D.C. And then in this report, I have a section from freedom to fascism, and then I have a section on the Illuminati, and then I have a section on Operation Paperclip, and then the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, how congressmen are being blackmailed, the Franklin cover-up, executive orders, details about the fourth closed-door session in the history of Congress in 176 years. A little information about the mainstream media. They deserve a lot of attention because they're as responsible as the corrupt politicians in Washington, D.C. And then I go into, in this report, the real terrorists, the CIA and the military intelligence and other intelligence agencies. And then in this report again, I say what's the future for those of us who are patriots. It's a dynamite document, and I want everybody here to make sure they take a copy of it and make copies yourself, give it to your friends, to your neighbors, whatever you want to do with it, but get the word out. Now, if you want to, I, I also have uh, some other material back there that you're, you're welcome to, but if you want to drop a little donation in the box, I won't turn it down. You spend 80 bucks making uh, 50 copies of this report for you to pass out. Um, I had a very illustrious career in the FBI. I graduated the University of Nebraska in 1950. I uh, didn't know what I wanted to do, bachelor science degree, business administration. Uh, I'm not proud of it, but I went through college without studying. I crammed the night before an exam. Uh, I was one of those guys that just went there for a lot of fun. My folks said, you gotta go to college whether you like it or not, and I did. Uh, and I had a lot of fun, it was a lot of fun. And in a way, it was very helpful to me because I ended up being able to memorize, uh, you know, in a short period of time before I took the exam. And then, of course, as soon as the exam was over, 
I, I forget all about what I just learned. But uh, I, uh, I graduated, didn't know what I wanted to do. I had a number of insurance offers and uh, turned them down. And then I heard about a friend of mine, a fraternity, not a friend of mine, but a fraternity brother who was president of Hormel Meatpacking. And I thought, well, I'll just go up and see if I can get a job at Hormel Meatpacking. So I went to Austin, Minnesota, hitchhiked from Lincoln, Nebraska to Austin, Minnesota. Took a job with Hormel and worked for about a year and a half in Detroit, Michigan, and didn't like it, although I was the most uh, successful uh, uh, salesman in the district. And one day I'm driving down Grand River Boulevard, if you know Detroit, and I heard about a friend of mine, Dick Kinsey from Falls City, Nebraska, a little small town, who had applied for the FBI, was accepted, and I said, you know, Dick and I used to chase girls and play poker and all that sort of thing, and I said, if Dick Kinsey can make it in the FBI, I can make it in the FBI. And I drove right downtown that fast. I made quick decisions, by the way. And <clears throat> I applied for the FBI. Now, the only problem I have, and had at that time, is you had to be 25 years of age, and I was 22 years of age. So the fellow who interviewed me, his name was Zimmerman. I'll never forget his name as long as I live. He liked me. He said, well, write a personal letter to J. Edgar Hoover and tell him, although you're only 22 years of age, you look like you're 28. Well, I actually looked like I was 18 or 19. I've always looked like, I, right now I'm 80 years old. People say you look like you're 65, right? I've always looked young for my age. So I wrote this letter to J. Edgar Hoover, and what do you know, six weeks later, I'm in Quantico, Virginia, and training a 14-week training course. And from Quantico, I went out to my first assignment and I had never been south of the Mason-Dixon line. I think the further south I was of, of Lincoln, Nebraska, my home, uh, was probably uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm assigned right in the middle of Alabama, Union Springs, Alabama, a small town of 2,500 people. Great experience. Uh, we were responsible, the senior partner and I were responsible for uh, five counties, anything that came up with the FBI in those five counties, including Phoenix City, Alabama, which are right across from Columbus, Georgia, and there was a big base there, Fort Benning, and Sin City, Phoenix City at that time was known as Sin City, and downtown Phoenix City uh, was not uh, Walgreens and Ralph's, it was bar, 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 bar on both sides of the street for about three blocks, heavy prostitution, uh, the town was run, was corrupt. The town at night was run by Buddy Jowers, uh, deputy chief, de excuse me, uh, deputy chief of police, assistant chief of police. And in the daytime by Albert Fuller, who was the deputy chief of the sheriff's office. And Albert Fuller later uh, cornered the uh, attorney general, Patterson, would run, he was going to clean up Phoenix City, cornered him in a parking lot and shot him and killed him. Last hour, of course, he went to jail, to, to prison in Montgomery, Alabama, and, and that, he's history. But that's a kind of an operation. It was a great experience for a brand new young kid going to the FBI. I mean, I was exposed to all kinds of criminal activity, kidnappings, extortions, and stolen cars, and the GIs. And, and the GIs would come over to, to, to Phoenix City on the weekends and gamble if they want too much money in the gambling, they'd, get their, they'd end up in the river. In the river. Uh, they'd take them out the back and take the money away from them and dump them in the river. So it was really an experience, and I don't regret it. I, I, uh, I had a lot of fun. I'd get up in the morning, and I'd look at my ship, and I'd be shaving, and I'd say, I can't believe they're paying me to go to work today. That's that kind of a job. So anyway, from Alabama, I'm going to get into current events pretty soon. I want to give you a little background on me. Uh, I've never done this for Dennis, I don't think, have I, Dennis? And he's been filming me for years. <laughs> uh, from, uh, from Phoenix, from uh, uh, Union Springs, Alabama, went to Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, there was the Atomic Energy Act case, uh, cases we were working in. And from there, I went to the Big Apple, New York City, worked counter espionage. From there, I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Communist Party USA general criminal. And while I was in Albuquerque, we had a bank robbery. And the robber stood in line and robbed the bank. 
And he turned around after he robbed the bank to the guy behind him. He said, did you see me rob the bank? The fellow said, yeah, I saw you rob the bank. And he blew him away. And the next guy behind him, he said, did you see me rob the bank? The fellow said, no, I didn't see it, but my wife did. <laughs> That's not a true story, folks. Uh, the, the, the men laugh at that, but the women don't, okay? <laughs> well, there's a lady over there with a smile. So, uh, so anyway, from Albuquerque, uh, William C. Sullivan, who was uh, number two man in the FBI. Actually, it was Hoover, Clyde Tolson, who was a figurehead, and then Sullivan, some other gentlemen. Both Bill Sullivan was quite a flamboyant individual, young little Irishman, not young, but he was a young Irishman, uh, young at heart, that is. And he came out to talk to the scientists of Los Alamos and took a shine to me and said, Ted, you need to go back to headquarters. So as a result of meeting Bill, who, uh, by the way, was liaison with the FBI and the Warren Commission, and uh, after he became involved in that assignment, he came to work one day, and uh, his name was scratched off the door, and the locks were changed, and I rather strongly suspect that he a little knew a little too much because Bill was a very, very honest man. And that, of course, the Warren Commission investigated the Jack Kennedy assassination. And I don't want to get off the topic, but Bill, later after he retired, became head of the DEA Drug Enforcement Agency. And then he retired from DEA, and he had a place up in New Hampshire in the woods, and he went up there hunting. And he was shot and killed by the son of a highway patrolman. He was sitting on his porch in his chair, and the kid said that he thought he was a deer. Um, I don't think there's any question. I think he was murdered because he knew too much about the Jack Kennedy assassination. But going on back to Bill, Bill promoted me to Washington, D.C. Uh, I worked uh, organized crime and racketeering as a supervisor. I had 26 field offices under me. Uh, that was when Bobby Kennedy was Attorney General, Jack was President, and then when Jack was murdered, I went over and worked uh, White House Special Inquiries under Johnson, and then I went out as number two man in the state of Connecticut, Assistant Special Agent in charge, uh, during the old Black Panther days, the late 60s, early 70s, then I went to, uh, exciting days by the way, uh, and then I went to uh, Philadelphia, I was number two man in Philadelphia, Assistant Special Agent in charge, then into Washington, D.C. as an inspector, chief inspector, and then out, I had my own division. Uh, I was in charge of the Memphis office division, which is uh, Western Tennessee. And then I was in charge of the Dallas, Texas office, and small uh, Memphis, small Dallas, and medium size. Dallas in charge of most of southern, uh, southern uh, northern Texas, excuse me. And then I was promoted out here to Los Angeles. I was in charge of the LA division. I had over 700 personnel under my command, $22.5 million budget. Um, in charge of most of Southern California, except for the San Diego area. Big responsibility, a lot of fun again. I basically was a public relations, gave speeches, did a lot of radio work and so forth. I, I'm a good delegator. I delegated all the time. I had good people under me, though, real quality people. And I was actually interviewed for the director's job in 1978. I was considered to be director of the FBI. But looking back there, there's no way they were going to hire a Hooverite, and I was basically a Hooverite. Now, one of the most uh, popular questions asked of me when I give lectures is, was Hoover gay? And uh, my answer to that is, well, I'm not a bad looking guy. I had a half a dozen meetings with him, uh, and he never put a move on me, okay? And then there's another comeback by me, and I say, uh, and this is, uh, means a lot to me, I, I don't, I said, well, you know, it's, it's okay to be gay unless you're J. Edgar Hoover, right? These are the times that we have here today. And then uh, after I retired, I was asked by Attorney General Griffin Bill to coordinate security for the Pan American Games, San Juan, Puerto Rico, 5,500 athletes. And then uh, I was uh, consulted for Governor Jerry Brown, California Narcotic Authority. And in 1979, I was uh, honored as the Outstanding Law Enforcement Officer of America by the AFL-CIO Mental Trades Council in Los Angeles. Uh, I've had, uh, I, I say this not in bragging or anything, but because I want to make it very clear I have credibility. 
and also want to make it very clear to the New World Order boys that because of my credibility, the information I put out to the public, which is quite extensive, and the research that I've done for the last 30 years is there, and I, have, I will stand behind everything that I've, that I've done. I have a library of DVDs of over 400 DVDs. I have a CD disc that I, I make available to the public, and everything that I have in my archives is available to you folks. And I want you to make copies like this intelligence report that I just put together for March. And I have a CD that has every one of my reports, over 30 reports, over the last 30 years that I've been attacking the rogue criminal element that's well entrenched in our government, 6,500 pages of over 30 reports. Those are available to you. So that's uh, basically the rundown of my background. Uh, and uh, I'm not some guy pushing a grocery basket looking for a recycling center. And the boys that I am criticizing on an almost daily basis and in my work, uh, they don't like the fact that I do have this credibility. You know, when our forefathers founded our government, they had the judiciary, the legislative, and executive branches. They had no idea that eventually there would be a fourth branch of the government, the covert government criminal enterprise is what I call it. And it's also known as the shadow government. I, uh, in the last 30 some years, I've exposed CIA drug operations. Uh, one of my first major investigations, the Dr. Jeffrey R. McDonald case, he's a former Green Beret doctor, was convicted of murdering his wife, two children, February 17, 1970, in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I've talked about it to the forum, not a forum before, I won't go into a lot of details. Um, he was tried, convicted, sentenced to three consecutive life sentences, and uh, right after I retired, I was asked to investigate the case. Within 10 months, I obtained a signed confession from Helena Stokely, a girl in the floppy hat, if you know the case, on the stand on the corner of the TMC, uh, said was standing there at the time when he was in route to the scene. And she said that Dr. McDonald did not commit those murders that were committed by her satanic cult group. I went public with the information, radio, TV, I was on Geraldo four times. Uh, I've been on a number of other stations, 48 Hours Mysteries, um, Inside Edition, and uh, I've, I went and I said, hey, this man is innocent. And uh, he was murdered, his family was murdered by a group of Satanists. And the reason the government's covering up that case is because this cult, satanic cult, were distributing drugs up and down the East Coast that were being flown in in the body cavities of the dead GIs from Southeast Asia. And if it came out that the cult was involved in these murders, it could have exposed the whole operation. Documentation on, on this is in January 1, 1973, Time Magazine. So I, I've, you know, I've done my part about exposing the drug operation. There's other people like uh, Gary Webb, who also done his part. He ended up being suicided. I'll go into, I'll mention that in a little while. And then another case that I had uh, is the Finders. And people find it very difficult to believe what I'm going to tell you now. But as an outgrowth of, a work, of some work that I did in the 1980s, the Franklin cover-up, which I'll get into also a little later on, I learned about an organization in Washington, D.C. involved in kidnapping children, taking children right off the street, and uh, international trafficking. And then later on, after I developed this information, it's very well documented. I have it in a report, one of my reports. There were two men and five young children, uh, in ages two to five, noted in a park in Tallahassee, Florida. And the police in Tallahassee were called. They went down the men were well dressed. They had a van with Virginia license plate. And the men were from Washington, D.C. They traced them back to this organization known as the Finders. The police in Washington, D.C. raided the Finders headquarters 
and they developed all kinds of information about international trafficking of children. They named Hong Kong, they named England, France, Germany, the Far East, all over the world. They also had information about terrorist activity that was taking place and explosives and what have you. As a result of this publicity uh, and the fact that it was actually a CIA covert operation, the uh, finders closed down their operation in Washington, D.C., and they're now operating, they continue to operate out of a church and a hospital in uh, Wichita, Kansas, uh, according to my informants. I have taken this complaint, this report that I have, it's called The Finders, and I have presented it to the FBI on a half a dozen occasions over the last 10 or 12 years, 15 years, and I have yet for them to come and talk to me about it. And the fact that it's a CIA operation is documented in a U.S. Customs report. The customs agent was involved in the investigation along with the Tallahassee Police and the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. So let's talk about the terrorist movement. Um, the October, the uh, February 26, 1993 car bombing World Trade Center, uh, that was uh, orchestrated by the FBI. Uh, they had an informant, Salam, who wore a body mark, Mike, when he met with the terrorists and very wisely, without the knowledge of the FBI, or the body mic when he met with the FBI with his handlers. And this came out during the trial, by the way. So uh, he was commissioned by the terrorists to put the bomb together. And he went to his FBI handlers, we're going to put a dummy bomb together, aren't we? And his FBI handler says, no, we're going to put a real bomb together. So the FBI not only knew about the car bombing of the World Trade Center in 93, but they furnished the ingredients for the bomb. Now this is in uh, the uh, New York Times, October 28, 1993, right there, black and white. And I cannot understand to this day why we have not had congressmen or somebody in the government jump up and down and, and say, I demand an investigation. It was never investigated. And then the next thing that came along was in the way of a terrorist movement was Oklahoma City, and that was April the 19th, 1995. I have a 222-page report on Oklahoma City. The fertilizer bomb in the truck was not a fertilizer bomb, as the government claims. It was an electro-hydrodynamic gaseous fuel device, which is a highly classified bomb. Uh, and it was tested in the early 19, 1982. In Area 51, it was so uh, the, its power was so un, un, uh, un, underestimated that one of the technicians died and uh, two of the technicians were injured. It was manufactured by Dyna Nobel out of Salt Lake City. It was designed by a fellow named Michael Reconosudo, and he worked with Hercules Manufacturing out of Silicon Valley. Now, if you look at the pictures of Oklahoma City, half the building is blown away with the fertilizer bomb. That's what the government says, of course. Well, no, this bomb was so powerful that it did that. And what happened was the, the uh, I'll call it the barometric bomb, the electrohydrodynamic gas fuel device, went off. Milliseconds later, a conventional bomb went off, and there were four other conventional bombs that were supposed to go off and bring the whole building down, but they did not go off. The four others did not go off. I have uh, tapes of the news broadcast uh, the afternoon of the bombing in Oklahoma City, I have five different news broadcasts, and the commentators said, oh, we're going to find out who's behind this now because they're bringing the bombs out that did not explode. One of them said it has U.S. Army stencil on the bomb. In the meantime, McVeigh, sure, he was involved. He was, a, he was a puppet. He was a pawn. McVeigh was visited by... Jolly West, who was one of the leaders of the MKO CIA mind control program, secret, Jolly West secretly uh, talked to him, interviewed him in Oklahoma and in Colorado. McVeigh was a mind control victim. Mm. Terry Nichols, the other co-defendant, sure, he was involved. He admits it. But he, in the meantime, 
and in January of last year, filed a 19-page affidavit in the U.S. District Court in Salt Lake City, <clears throat> wherein he says that McVeigh told him that the person who orchestrated the Oklahoma City bombing was Larry Potts, the number two man in the FBI under the former director, Louis Free, who resigned under a cloud. I made two trips to Oklahoma City, myself, personally. I developed this information about the barometric bomb, um, and I learned what the contract number was on the barometric bomb, and I wrote to Picatinny Arsenal in New Jersey, and I said that I wanted, oh, I just broke this. I said that I wanted the, uh, a copy of the contract, which is uh, public source information. Sorry about that, Wendy. Oops. I can probably operate with it. Okay, and I uh, wrote to Picatinny Arsenal, and um, I gave them the contract number, which I obtained from a science magazine, and they wrote back and said there's no such contract. Contracts are available to the public, by the way, government contracts. Uh, I talked to an inside investigator in Oklahoma City, and he told me that there were at least 11 other people involved in the Oklahoma City bombing. And our government's done nothing to further identify them. The Patsies were McVeigh and Terry Nichols. And of course, 911, there's been so much publicity on 911, I don't think I have to go into details of that. But there's no question about it. Uh, that was an inside job. That was the terrorist act that really woke up America, I think. The others they were able to cover over. over uh, but uh, I don't think they're going to be able to do it with 911. There's so many citizens' groups that are that sprung up around the country. But the, uh, what's the purpose of these terrorist acts? I mean, why is the government involved in them? Well, the government's involved in them because they wanted to pass the Patriot Act, take away many of our constitutional liber and, and civil liberties. Now, let's take a look at the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act originally was written under George Herbert Walker Bush's administration, and a female lady Department of Justice attorney who was involved in uh, writing it publicly made the statement before this passes people will have to be killed and she was right and that's what happened with 911 and some of these other matters however the Patriot Act as written was approved in October of 2001 by 36 members of the Judiciary Committee in Washington, D.C., the Congress. And it was to be voted on on October the 26th. In fact, that's the date it was voted on. And the original Patriot Act was set aside at 3.45 a.m. that morning and substituted with a 300-page uh, Patriot Act written by a Vietnam uh, scholar named Viet Dinh, who was magna cum laude at Harvard. And at the time of the act, uh, he was with the U.S. Department of Justice. He actually authored the Patriot Act. It was passed, by the way, I, he graduated in magna cum Lottie at Harvard, I graduated made to come lucky at Nebraska. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it, it was passed by Congress, and not one member of the Congress read the act. They whistled it right on through because George Bush, our illustrious traitor president, had it substituted at 3.45 a.m. The people in Congress passed a bill that none of them read. So what did it do? Well, it totally destroyed the First Amendment of the Constitution, freedom of speech, Fourth Amendment, to be secure in your home, Fifth Amendment, deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, Sixth Amendment, right to a speedy trial, 
Eight, no cruel and unusual punishment. Ninth, punishment without conviction. Under the Patriot Act, the government can come into your home, steal your secrets, steal your files, steal your records, take these records to Washington, D.C., Department of Justice, and in front of a judge, review them, and then come out and arrest you without you having representation of an attorney, without you being advised of your rights, without you even knowing what you're being charged with, and without due process. This is the Patriot Act. Believe it or not. And they got away with it. Now, 262 Republicans and 77 Democrats killed the Bill of Rights. And then we have, obviously, some other bills that were passed. There was a bill that was passed that did away with the uh, Posse Comitatus, where the government cannot use the military against civilians. They're using them now, and they can't use them against civilians. They use them in Waco. Okay. Um, what's, what's been the result as far as I'm concerned? What have they done to me? You don't want to know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It's been unreal. It's been a roller coaster ride like I never expected in my whole life. I've been the victim of cyber terrorism. They put porno on my computer at home. I know I'm a computer illiterate. That's a department I'm illiterate in. I'm probably illiterate in a couple of other departments too. But I have an associate, Clarence Malcolm, who uh, runs my computer and uh, puts together my DVDs that are available to you folks and so on and so forth. And they're run, trying to run porn or pornography in there on a regular basis. And every time it comes in, <clears throat> of course, we cut it off. They interfere with our email messages. They change the wording in it. Uh, we put together ads, and they take words out and change the whole meaning of the ad. I came home from a trip last year on one of my trips. I travel a lot. Uh, one step ahead of my creditors, okay? And... I got up and about 8.27, the phone rang, and I was looking for a file on, on, on my desk, and I couldn't find it. And a male voice said, did you find the file? And hung up. I had a hidden camera in my living room. Uh, I was unloading my luggage in Lafayette, Louisiana, one day last, May 21st last year, as a matter of fact. I unloaded, brought it out at the, at the airport. I was, actually, I was loading it into the car. And I get hit with a high energy beam of some sort. Fortunately, it was not calibrated properly. I know because all I got was a sunburn on my back. And I stripped down to get ready for bed that night, and my back was burned. My colleague, Clarence Malcolm, was less fortunate than I. He got hit with a high energy beam, and according to our diagnosis, uh, it destroyed the uh, tissues around the nerves, and he's been in terrible pain ever since. Had surveillances on me continuously in LA, Las Vegas. They even have surveillances on me in a little town where I live in Nebraska called Claytonia, Nebraska. 296 people I had to move there for security reasons so I could see them coming when they came around the corner. Had threatening phone calls. As a matter of fact, I had a threatening phone call just last month. And the person who made the call, I was able to record two of them, by the way, went right to my voicemail in, uh, in Claytonia. I was able to trace it <coughs> to a man who lives in Encino, right down the road. And I did, uh, I found out his name, address, and so forth. I did a little check on him. <coughs> He is a CIA official with uh, cyber clearance and crypto clearance, not cyber, but crypto clearance, level 31, crypto clearance level 31. Does anybody know what crypto clearance level 31 is? Do you know it, sir? 
Do you know what triple <coughs> clearance level 31 is? Is that a high clearance? How high? Pretty high, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I looked, I looked it up on the internet and couldn't find it. Well, this is the fellow who made this threatening phone call to me. By the way, that phone call is on, on my website. If you want to tune in on it, go to my uh, freeviamail.com, and uh, you can check it out. <clears throat> There's profanity on there, so uh, don't have any kids around when you're listening to it. My mail has been <clears throat> tampered with, been stolen. A uh, check came in uh, to my home in uh, Nebraska, and it was on the floor of the post office. I've had five attempts on my life. On one occasion, I had two men sitting across from my front door in Westwood, California, back in 1982. And uh, the landlady, I didn't go home that night, fortunately, through divine intervention. The landlady parked her car at 1.30, and the, one of the fellows got out of the car, came over, you know where Ted Gunners lives? I told her, don't ever tell anybody where I live. She said no, and then she went up on the second floor. She lived above me and looked out the window, and they left at a quarter of one. Quarter of one thirty, we quarter of two, excuse me. And so uh, I came home the next day and I made some phone calls and I found out I had a hit on me. Uh, and not only that, I had two hits on me, two contracts on me. I went to, I knew where to go to get one of the hits taken off, and I made <coughs> a little visit with uh, this gentleman. And uh, that's another story, but it's kind of amusing because uh, <coughs> I was with three other gentlemen. I didn't want to go alone. And we were <coughs> let in, made an appointment. <coughs> and one of the fellows I was with was an ex-con, and he knew this individual. And we were we knocked on the door, made an appointment, and uh, a gentleman, a man came and uh, let us in, went to the parlor, and uh, a dog came in, sat down, the dog, little dog came in and smelled all of us and sat right on my feet and went to sleep. And the uh, man I went came to see, uh, uh, said, uh, walked in the room, he said, my dog likes you, I like you. So anyway, uh, long story short, uh, we sat down, had a little visit, and he excused the other three individuals, I told him my situation, he uh, went and made a phone call, came back, said, I took one hit off of you, I can't take the other one off. The one hit was by the Israeli Mafia, which he was able to get rid of, and the other hit was by the satanic cults out of, uh, Houston, Texas. So um, my car's been stolen. I've had illegal entries into my home on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, um, when I'm in L.A., I stay at two different places. I have to stay with somebody or I'll be suicided, and I know how they operate. But I went by, when my daughter's not here, she's overseas right now, but I went by the place to pick up uh, a material for this lecture tonight, and the material was kept in my daughter's house, it's gone, it's missing. So they went, came into my daughter's house this last month while I was gone and uh, took uh, some more of my material. They're, they're, they're in and out of my houses and locations and offices uh, on a regular basis. It's, it's like Grand Central Station, to be honest with you. I had my car stolen, I had two further attempts that I interrupted. Oh, thanks, Wendy. Actually, I already have one, Wendy, but I'm just not using it. Um, I've had my brake line cut. Um, I have had an unusual number of flat tires. I've been poisoned. I, was, I moved from Los Angeles to Las Vegas in 1994, and I was in my condominium. And I felt, didn't feel right. And I knew there was a problem with me. And being, as I'm very paranoid, you know, being paranoid is healthy. And the more paranoid you are, the healthier you are. And uh, so I went down and had the blood test. I had arsenic and cyanide in me. And uh, what they were doing, I think, they were pumping poison in from the condominium next door. I never saw anybody over there, but I know there was somebody there. And what they did, whatever they pumped in there, in addition to the arsenic and cyanide, gave me high blood pressure. So I'm fighting high blood pressure now. 
I've never had high blood pressure before. So what they want to do with me is, you know, we die of a stroke or heart attack. And they say the old guy died of natural causes. My front uh, wheel came off, driving 75 miles an hour on the freeway back in the middle 80s. And uh, I was driving from Omaha to Lincoln, Nebraska. I was back to work in the Franklin cover-up case. It was kind of funny. I was driving like the cars like this, and all of a sudden it went like this. And I look off to the right, and here's my wheel spinning about 15 feet in the air. And a uh, highway patrolman came along. He said, uh, well, yeah, the, somebody loosened your lug nuts. And the lug nuts on the left front, we were also loosened, but uh, apparently they, somebody interrupted them. Uh, I had an explosive device put on my tire in Sacramento last November. I was going to drive from Sacramento to L.A. And it's a little item that's about one inch by one inch by half an inch. And I happened to come out. I, I've looked my car over pretty closely. <clears throat> and I saw this. It was stuck on there on the inside of the front left tire. I had to pry it off with a screwdriver. Didn't something that just stuck there accidentally. And you could hold it up to the light, and you could see a wire in there. So I think it was a, a detonator. They were, were going to detonate this explosive of some sort, according to an expert, and um, blow the tire on my drive from Sacramento down here to L.A. In uh, 1982, I came out of my front door, 500 Kelton in Westwood. And what do you think greeted me on the porch? 13 dead red roses and 13 dead chrysanthemums with a note. Poacher in the grass, once a cub, the lion sees shades of life and death. Signed, Eddie, June 15, 1982. Eddie is a nickname of one of the cult murders, satanic cult murders on the Jeffrey McDonald case. 1983, um, the FBI and the DEA tried to set me up on a drug deal. A girl named Pam Fawcett, after six months, she came to me and told me the whole story. I met her in the parking lot right down the street. It was uh, Ralph's Market on uh, Sepulveda. She drove down from Modesto. I said, I'll meet you in the market, in the, in the parking lot. She told me the whole story. I gave her a polygraph. She passed. And uh, I said, Pam. Her name was Pam Fawcett. Why'd you come over to my side? You were working for those guys for two, six months. And she said, well, I woke up the other morning, and I realized you're the only honest son of a bitch I've talked to in six months. Those were exact words. So I, at least I made an impression on somebody in my lifetime. But anyway, Pam, and the last time I talked to her, she said that uh, there was a contract out on her, and she was going to uh, go underground, get lost. I've had 18 to 20 people planted on me. I've had so many, many people planted on me, I feel like the Garden of Eden. Uh, guys like Stu Webb, he came into my life back in the late 90s. Stayed, I, I gave him food, gas, even bought him a suit. And then he left, and uh, if you check the internet, you're going to find out that uh, he's put extensive disinformation about me on the internet. Stu Webb, and uh, also uh, Barbara Hartwell. Stu Webb's an FBI informant, by the way. And I have this documented. Barbara Hartwell's from a CIA family. Uh, I ran for uh, U.S. Senate in Nevada on a third party ticket out of five candidates in uh, 1996. And I, of the third party candidates, I was I came in third of all the candidates, so I beat out the other two candidates and the other two parties. But of course, you're not going to beat out a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, but uh, my campaign manager was a fellow named Jim Kloberg. And I find out later, after the campaign, that he stole money from the campaign. And I found out the bank account that he used to take the money and deposit it, I found out his bank account number, which is an election law violation, right? Federal violation. I gave it to the FBI, and they uh, refused to do anything or to even talk to me about it. And I find out that he was, in, in fact, a, an FBI informant. 
So I've kind of reviewed uh, the Patriot Act, Bill of Rights. Uh, we had a closed door session of Congress last March. I think some uh, Linda or somebody just mentioned that a few moments ago. And in that closed door session, I think it was March the 10th, I'm not sure of the exact day, it was discussed that they were going to destroy the economy, break the economy of the country in September of last year, which happened. And they were, the government was going to go bankrupt in February of this year. They also discussed the new surveillance techniques that were being designed and directed against American citizens, and also where the congressman would go if there is a civil unrest and where they can seek sanctity and safety. So they're going to take care of themselves. There's absolutely no question about it. In my report, I mentioned the executive orders. They're on page 10, by the way. And these executive orders, when they're in place, they're in place today, as a matter of fact. And the government, with a swipe of a pen, the government can take over all forms of transportation, all communications, media, telecommunications, internet, radio and television, all electric power, fuels and minerals, all means of transportation, including your personal car. Uh, all sources, farms, mobilized citizens, all health education, welfare functions, the post office, all airports and aircraft, air, uh, railroads, public uh, storage, and all financial institutions. And all the president has to do is a swipe of a pen. He can take over all the items mentioned above. On page five of this report, When Attorney General Ashcroft came in to be Attorney General, I wrote him a letter. This paragraph, the first paragraph on page five, is from the letter that I wrote to Ashcroft. We have, our government has an extensive computer system used by the government, the shadow government, knows exactly when and where you rent a car, make airplane reservations, check into hotel or motel, keep track of your bank accounts, keep track of all your credit cards and records, gun purchases, your passport applications, magazine subscriptions, medical prescriptions, academic records, driver's license, bridge toll records, judicial and divorce records, and telephone records. Ladies and gentlemen, they have us covered like a blanket. Um, in 96, uh, uh, in addition to running for the uh, U.S. Senate in Nevada, I ran for President of the United States, okay? And I re-registered for Republican to Democrat, and I knew that I didn't have a chance to get those, against those slick willy, but I figured uh, some people urged me to, to go run, and I did. And uh, I tried to get to New Hampshire for the Hampshire, New Hampshire primary, and Kloberg would not give me airfare to get there, but in spite of that, I came out, I think, uh, 10th or 11th out of 21 candidates. And then I did get to Texas. And by the way, uh, if, you, if somebody tells you that the, the poor man can run for president of the United States, you're going to believe that? Just to register in the primary, it takes over $100,000. Uh, $1,000 in New Hampshire, $2,500 in Texas. But I did raise the money to run in Texas. And I went down there for three weeks. I came in a fifth out of all the candidates there. We had over 15,500 votes. But I checked in a hotel in Austin, Texas on this one occasion. And um, I used a fictitious name to check in. You could do it then. You can't do it now because they want to see your driver's license. Just like when you go through the airport, when you check in a hotel, let me see your driver's license. Let me see some identification. And they get on the computer, and it goes right back to Washington. Anyway, I checked in under another name. Uh, the lady who was uh, promoting me, a former state uh, uh, senator, uh, Myra Dipple is her name. She gave me her credit card and gave me her car to run around in and all that sort of thing. Wonderful lady from uh, Tyler, Texas. 
and I went to my room and I wrote a couple of letters and came back out. I made a phone call home and uh, I laid the letter down for the clerk to put a stamp on them and mail them. And of course, he didn't, I was registered on another name, right? He says, oh, I just had a phone call looking, somebody called and looking for you. So the, the only people that knew I was there was my home, people at my home. And uh, they obviously traced the call to that hotel. And uh, so that's, that's the way that they're keeping track of all of us. Um, I've skipped around. I've, I wrote a little outline here. I can't even find out where I am on my, on my outline. But under the Patriot Act, there have been over 5,000 um, individuals who've been arrested. One of the more unbelievable cases involved a woman named Tamara Jo Freeman. Did you hear about that in the newspaper? Tamara Jo Freeman, on January 22nd, 2007, was flying on Frontier Airline from San Francisco to Denver. She had three children under four years of age, and uh, she uh, spanked one of them. When they landed in Denver, she was arrested under the Terrorist Act. She was detained for three months before she was uh, able, to, able to plead guilty. Her attorney told her to plead guilty, uh, or she would never see her children again. She pled guilty, and then they sentenced her to one year in prison. She was uh, released from prison very recently, and her visitation with her children now are a phone call once a week. They're in a foster home. There have been over 200 people arrested on airplanes under the Patriot Act. There have been over 5,000 people arrested throughout the United States under the Patriot Act itself. Um, I have a, a, a section in this terrorist report about the news media, and it's on page uh, 11. Ryan Gumbel, you remember him? He had that morning show in the morning. He was interviewing James uh, Nichols, Terry Nichols' brother. James is uh, Terry Nichols, of course, being the co-defendant of the Oklahoma City bombing. And Gumbel, and, and, and I'd sent uh, James my Oklahoma City report, 222-page report. And he says to Gumbel, did you read Ted Gunderson's report on Oklahoma City? And Brian Gumbel says, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist cast me aside as a conspiracy theorist. I want you to know I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I'm a conspiracy realist. There is a conspiracy. <laughs> Do you all know about the Illuminati? Does anybody here doesn't know about the Illuminati? You don't know about it. You do not. Okay. The man behind you doesn't know. Okay. You do know. Okay. Is there anybody that doesn't know about the Illuminati? Well, uh, the, very briefly, 1773, the 25 goals were announced to take over the world, and they were just a couple of them, corrupt the youth through sex and drugs. That's happened through the media and other sources. Uh, control the mainstream media, elect your own people to office, and so on and so forth. But uh, going back to Brian Gumbel, um, as I pointed out on page 11, you will not read in the American mainstream media the information set forth there. One, the NSA and the FBI have teamed up with AT&T and Verizon to spy on U.S. citizens. This is all documented, by the way. President Bush reauthorized a secret program more than 30 times to spy on Americans since 911. The U.S. government, NSA, has tapped into the entire Internet system. The FBI can hear everything you say, even though your cell phones are turned off. The code word for this program is Quantico. All pay phones at Grand Central Station in New York City are tapped. The Bush administration began spying on Americans seven months prior to 911. The president authorized our intelligence agencies to database every citizen in the United States seven months prior to 911. Project Endgame 
rounding up the 775,000 Americans by the shadow government began, according to a Soviet source, on February 24, 2009, just a few days ago. And I think what they're going to do, I think, I don't know, I have to be honest with you, I speculate to a degree when I say this, they are going to round up the less known American patriots first, and then they will come after some of the rest of us. Uh, there is uh, Rex 84, a program that was designed by that great American uh, Marine hero, Holly North, drug dealer, and what have you. And that was to uh, organize a plan to arrest uh, Americans. There's a red, blue, and green list. The red, blue, the red list are the ones that will be picked up and executed immediately. There's 30,000 guillotines in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Montana. The House Bill 1274 was introduced to the Georgia State Senate House of Representatives. 1995-1996, the bill allowed the state of Georgia to use the guillotine in death penalty cases, uh, allowing prisoners to dedicate their body organs. There are half a million caskets in Atlanta, Georgia, that will hold four bodies. There are railroad cars, especially built by Gunderson Railroad Company out of Portland, Oregon, no relation that I know of, I hope not. Aluminum benches with shackles at the ankle level. I've seen these cars, I saw one of these cars. I was driving from Los Angeles to Las Vegas and my headlights hit an overpass, a railroad overpass, just before I went under it in Barstow and I saw that car. That car is for real. Now, in my research, I learned that there is a, an airport runway in Beatrice, Nebraska. Beatrice, Nebraska, by the way, my, as I said, my, I live in a little small town, Clintonia, Nebraska, uh, 290 people. And uh, I'm about 20 miles from Beatrice and about 30 miles, 35 miles from Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln to the north and Beatrice to the south. But Beatrice, a town of 12,500 people, has a runway at this airport over a mile long with no commercial airline traffic coming in or out. Recently, the Patriots in that community have noted black helicopters maneuvering at the airport. And I suspect that what they're gonna do, they're gonna use the black helicopters to come in and land in our front yards, men with, uh, in, dressed in black, with guns drawn, will come in, break down your door, put you on a helicopter, fly you to, in Nebraska, southeast Nebraska, probably Beatrice, put you on a commercial plane, you'll fly to Atlanta, Georgia, or some other location where there's a guillotine, and that'll be it. A government official has made the statement that the best way to preserve body parts is death by guillotine. Now, I think it's rather ironic that Georgia passed this bill 1995-1996. That's over 10, 11, 12 years ago. Only in the state of Georgia. So that's where it's probably going to happen. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, let me, before I, before I go any further, let me tell you about another very interesting case that I had recently to show you the extent of the cover-up and also the extent of the satanic activity and the control that the Satanists have over our system. Um, I have exposed this corrupt situation, this covert rogue element within our government city, county, and state, and the federal level. But let me say this also, there's a lot of good people in the government. There's overt and there's covert. The overt guys are like, fellows like me with a tie, go out to the bank robbery, uh, ask the clerk, uh, the teller, uh, what did he look like, how tall was he, so on and so forth. The rogue covert are the boys who are involved in the kidnappings, illegal drugs, and this is what, these monies is what they use to keep track of all of us 
and the surveillance is on me and so forth. Private enterprise, they operate looking for some way of return for their money. Now, I, they, they have to spend. With all the surveillances I've had on me and their surreptitious entries, just this month at my daughter's apartment since I came back, and by the way, in Claytonia, Nebraska, I was gone for some time and they came in. I have 500 boxes of research in one of my bedrooms and 200 boxes were missing. Now, is Walmart, Walgreens, General Motors, General Electric, are they interested in my research? No, of course not. This is the covert criminal shadow government that's doing this. Not only doing it to me, they're doing it across the country. I've talked to people. People come to me from all walks of life complaining about what's happening to them. Mind control, surveillances, surreptitious entries into their homes and their offices. But let me tell you about this other case now. And it's kind of interesting because a fellow named John <coughs> Van Meter, he's a logger in northern Wisconsin. He's a wannabe author, <coughs> like some of the rest of us. And he attended a conference in Sonoma County, California, here in October of 2004. And being a logger, he went out into the woods and looked the situation over. And at midnight on October 31st, he's out in the middle of the woods, and in comes five and six automobiles, men and women dressed in black, a woman who's bound and gagged in the nude, and they spot him, they start shooting at him. Well, John, being an outdoorsman, had his gun, and he shot back. And what happened is he had interrupted a satanic ceremony. He shot and killed four of them. The leader fled into the woods. The girl, the rest of them fled in their cars. He grabbed the girl in the nude, a young lady, 21 years old put her in a car and said, get lost, and she took off in her car, in a car, one of the subject's cars, and then he put his attention toward going after the leader who had fled into the woods. <clears throat> they had a running conversation, and the leader of the group said, if you kill me, you'll live in a 10 by 10 cell the rest of your life. We have the police and the FBI in our hip pocket here. Um, he ended up running him down and shooting him. He took a card out of his pocket with a phone number on it. It was a restaurant in uh, New York City. And he later checked on that restaurant. It's a non-existent restaurant. But he did make a phone call to the number that was on the back of the card. It was a 202 number the next day. And a female voice answered, FBI. The next day, he called, and of course, he, she hung up right away because he didn't have the right code word, obviously. And the next day, he tried again, and that phone line had been disconnected. Another card was to the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City, the main switchboard number. Long story short, he wasn't sure exactly what to do. He just shot and killed five people. And uh, he went to the newspapers, told them about it. It didn't go to the police. And it did eventually get back to the police. And uh, he told, he talked to the police and told them where the, it took place. He, in the meantime, had gone back to Wisconsin. And they waited four days to go out to the scene. And then they called him and said there was no indication that there was any sort of a, a fiasco of any type that took place at that particular location. He told them where the body was of the leader. They said there was no body there. He was charged with filing a false report with the police. And his attorney told him, don't come back to Sonoma County. That's where Bohemian Grove is, right? Don't come back to Sonoma County. It's corrupt. You'll go to jail. So his attorney made a deal with uh, the district attorney, $10,000 fine and one year probation. The attorney did him a favor. Now, that's not the end of the story. On April the 19th, 2006, he's in the woods in Wisconsin. 
He noticed that a car had followed him out into the woods, and he parked his car, got behind some equipment, and the car came up within a reasonable distance. Two guys got out, and here one of them say, he's mine, he's mine. Well, these two fellows didn't know that John Van Meter carries his gun with him at all times, even though he's on probation, and he had a gun battle with these two fellows. Knock one of them down four times, knock one of them down two times. They obviously had bulletproof vests on. They'd had enough, and they took off. They got in the car and took off. Uh, I did a little work, did a little investigative work, and I found out that one of them later uh, was a murder victim in Colorado, Santa Colorado Springs, Colorado. And the other one, we think, uh, they were so severely it wounded that I think that uh, he died. They, they both died. They went to a doctor in Chicago, we found out, and the doctor treated them and told them the, that they needed to go to the hospital. They wouldn't go to the hospital. So he reported it to the police in Wisconsin. Anybody want to guess what the police did about that case? They said he filed a false charge. Okay. And last April, I went to Wisconsin to the trial to testify on his behalf. Now he was, uh, they said he shot himself, okay. We had an expert from Madison, Wisconsin, uh, ballistics expert, forensic expert, who testified he did not shoot himself, no way. He, in the two skirmishes, was shot nine times by six different weapons none of which were recovered. And in California, he was convicted of file a false charge. And in Wisconsin, at a trial, he was convicted of filing a false charge. That's the, oh, and I found out that the district attorney in Wisconsin had at one time been the district attorney in San Francisco, California, which is loaded with Satanists. Sonoma County, as you probably know, is just north of, of San Francisco. Marin and Sonoma County. One of the leaders, by the way, one of the contracts on me was put out in the 1980s was by Michael Aquino. Michael Aquino was one of the founders of the Church of Satan and later split from the Church of Satan and developed his own group called the Church of Set, uh, Sa excuse me, the Temple of Set. And uh, they had an international convention. Temple said had an international convention here about two months ago, three months ago, whatever it was. I went up, and uh, four of us, we did a series of interviews on the sidewalk in front of the hotel in San Francisco. And uh, long story short, of the four of us, two of us were arrested. I wasn't one of them. Uh, two guys, two of the fellows with me, had to, each of them had spent a night in jail, and so on and so forth. That's the clout that these people have. The cults have infiltrated. Illuminati are the same thing as the satanic cults. They've infiltrated, as I said, every level of society. Again, let me emphasize there's good people in the government. Uh, when I was in the government, when I was with the FBI for 27 years, uh, we had a reputation second to none. We were not infiltrated at that time. It was only after the death of J. Edgar Hoover that the reputation and the effectiveness of this great organization diminished to the extent it is today. Um, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yeah. We'd like to. Uh, now, I want to urge before wait a minute before we before we take questions. Let me mention this. Um, I'm moving to Panama. Um, I cannot. I can operate in this country only for a limited time until they pick me up. I'm on the red list. I don't think there's any question about it. So I give these lectures all over the country. I'm going to Pensacola. Uh, later this month, and I've lectured in Philadelphia and New York. I've lectured all over, so I'm, I'm on the red list. Okay, I, that's a that's a given. And I cannot be effective and fight these people, which I will continue to do as long as I'm alive, from the shores of the United States. So I'm going over. I'm going to Panama with my associate Clarence Malcolm. And we're going to fight them from there on the internet and any way that we possibly can. So, um, 
it's in the terrorism report that i put back on the back table the fact that we are moving to panama and also for those of you who are interested in surviving economically we have a multi level program and it's called world light funding it's on the business cards in the back and w r l d l i g h t funding and uh it's uh hang on do you need some more water it's sinus world light funding and it's a if you get in now it's a one time $59 investment you don't have to put money in it every month residual income and uh i think it's uh, going to be it's going to take off and it's only $59 you can't lose so if you lose 59 bucks what's the big deal right but you're not going to lose i guarantee you that and <clears throat> the product is uh, ebay uh, books and um so i urge you to join the world uh, light funding um a multi level program <coughs> i want you to make sure you have copies of my intelligence report and if you would like to receive an intelligence report on a monthly basis let us know it's uh, $25 a month and we give you like i don't know what malcolm has now 5 6 dvds along with the report itself this is our march report so questions uh yeah ted uh, we want to thank you for uh, coming back to the granada forum um due to the circumstances of what's going on um and of course you listen to George Nori I know and and Alex what what do you think the bottom line is how how can average americans try not to cooperate with these evil monsters i mean how what's what do you what do you think's the best course of action or fundamentally what what do you suggest well uh, first of all economically i, I urge uh, this multi level program or other multi level programs i think that's that we can help each other This particular program is in 100 is in 32 countries around the world. Or maybe 132, I mean 32, 132, whatever. Anyway, I'm not sure. Uh, my associate Clarence Malcolm, who by the way was pricked uh with uh the back of his head by a stranger uh and he ended up with uranium 235. We were able to overcome that problem. So he's been attacked also. My first webmaster was murdered. My second one was set up on a phony child molestation car charge and Malcolm's my third one is is as Malcolm said it's not real healthy to be your webmaster um uh, <clears throat> but i think the what i what i think's going to happen i you know i think we're going to have martial law we're going to have another terrorist act that's going to make 911 look like a Sunday school class and um and they're going to declare martial law think everything's in line for that we have uh we've seen germ we've seen the foreign troops in uh Colorado, Oregon and we got uh, Germans have the Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico and it, as I mentioned in this report uh a lady talked to me in 1996 said that she deliberately dated one of the German airmen to find out why they're there and he told her when the revolution comes we're going to be strafing the seats the streets of America by the way I forgot to mention one other thing going back to Oklahoma City Bill Clinton gave a speech in Hanover, New Hampshire in June of 1995 right after uh, Oklahoma City. And he said that the bomb in the truck was a miracle of technology. I told you it was a barometric bomb, electrohydrodynamic gas exchange device. It was. He knew it. Highly classified bomb. Bill Clinton said a bomb miracle of technology yes sir question yes that uh my understanding uh been a lot of research uh supposedly these closed military bases are based on being converted to detention camps i've heard that that's right and also i had a, a friend of mine was hunting in michigan ran to some russian troops out there doing maneuvers and he said what the hell are you guys doing here he said well we're over here for a goodwill uh, uh exercises and things like you know horse bullshit you know things like that so it's it's just amazing to me how things are accelerating and uh you know 
the collapse of the economy and stuff like that. And uh, I fear for people's lives. And I see things happening. You know, it's getting. I have some friends in law enforcement, and they're seeing you know a, a speed up of nationalization of of uh, the police forces in the United States, as well as the nationalization of our economy, the banks and stuff like that through the the name of bailouts, which is a bunch of crap. So I, you know, I see a total uh, disintegration. And the people in the room here, I would highly recommend you store food and water, things like that, because uh, I do see things unraveling to the point that you won't be able to go to the grocery store or anything else. It's just going to be, it's going to be utter chaos and stuff like that. And they're going to declare martial law, and then they're going to clamp down on our freedom because this was instituted in, under Bill Clinton. Uh, quite a few of these uh, 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 executive orders and stuff like that. Absolutely. All right, thank 100%, you. I agree with you 100. Right, percent Thank you. So be sure to speak into the mic so we can get you on the uh, on the film here. Ted, you were mentioning uh, Timothy McVeigh and Jolly West, the CIA uh, psychiatrist that was involved in the MK Ultra mind control experiments. He also was involved with the Son of Sam in New York. Uh, Charles Manson. That's right. Uh, Sir Han Sir Han. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was also involved in the Columbine murders, some of the kids involved there. Columbine, yeah. Exactly. And he was also the psychiatrist when Jack Ruby was in jail. Thank you very much, Fred. <laughs> I knew all that, too. <laughs> And a lot of these people, a lot, some of these serial killers that I mentioned, of course, belong to the final process church, which is a, is a satanic church. So they're using all these people to enact some kind of a political agenda. But, uh, you know, the talking about you going to Panama, Mexico, of course, is being criminalized through the New World Order's uh, control over the drug networks in the CIA. How soon before we see the level of laws, such as our Patriot Act, that's being posted before and generalized through Mexico and Latin America? How soon is it going to happen down there? I have no idea. I'd be guessing. But I think that uh, following, you know, let's face it, we know, everybody in this room knows, if you can conquer America, and they've tried to conquer us from within back in the, like I say, during the Communist Party days, if you can conquer America, you can take on basically any country. We have... China and India now, who are really the big guns in the world, will be, I think, after we, after our demise. Uh, but I, I'm sure that the New World Order has, I know they have plans. They've got this super highway that's coming up from Mexico into Canada. The people of Texas won't stand still for it, and they put a stop on it. Uh, the, uh, they tried to confiscate their land in order to build the highway, and some people, they're having uh, riots, not riots, but uh, demonstrations and so forth in Texas. So. I think it's a matter of time, you know, they're not going to stand still. Uh, they're going to keep pushing. The New World Order will. Well, there's been talks recently of U.S. military starting to go into towns like Juarez, where uh, all these pervasive killings taking place, and Tijuana. Juarez, as a matter of fact, uh, 7,000 more Mexican military troops were sent over the weekend, and they've been having talks already with Canada and the United States to standardize the surveillance all across. So it's part of the what you call the uh, coming North American Union. And uh, in Arcadia, Iowa, here just in the last couple of weeks, the National Guard had some maneuvers there where they were going house to house and asking people to come in and search their house for guns and so forth. And uh, of course, the people were told this is just a little maneuver, just a little practice. I don't think anything of it, it's not a problem. Uh, and, and the National Guard was doing that. By the way, I might also mention that the U.S. Marine tanks here about three months ago, were involved in the exit entry on I-15 in the San Diego area doing maneuvers there. So they're going to control the highways. There's sensors in the highways. They will know exactly where your car is at any given time. I talked to one of the men in California who was installing the sensors in the highways. And that's all documented. Yes. Oh, Ted, thanks for your courage. And uh, I'd like to point out... Uh, to people that may not know this, that two of the primary architects of Homeland Security are Marcus Wolf, former security chief of the Stasi, and Kalugin, who came from the KGB. Um, I don't know if anyone thinks Obama's going to save them, but uh, he's not talking about stopping wiretapping, the Patriot Act, or any of the other things you're discussing. Um, spy satellites have been retasked. You probably know that. They're feeding that to local police departments in real time now. 
that's completely illegal. Um, there's a Homeland Security reality show. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Yeah, it's on weekly now. It's, it's a reality show. They show people being stopped for having undeclared money on airplanes. They're propagandizing us, and, uh, and every phone is tapped. Every cell call, every fax, it's all being stored. So it's not just phones in Grand Central Station. It's, it's every, oh, absolutely. Yeah, every communication. But thank you for your courage. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I, had, uh, I, I drove from, uh, in November, I drove from uh, Claytonia to uh, Los Angeles. And uh, outside of St. George, Utah, there was a, it was night. It was around 4.30 in the morning. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm driving 75. I'm a pretty fast driver. The limit, so you know. And here's this object in front of me. I thought it was steel uh, girder or something. It was actually a deer, I found out later. And, and so I ran over it. And um, so I pulled over to the side, called the operator 911, and she told me exactly where I was located. She said, I know where you are. You're doing so many words. You're, you're here, 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 and here. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, hi, Ted. Uh, on your material on page 12, it uh, shows the School for Dictators, School of Assassins, and it mentions a number down here in Panama, about a 4,235. So I'm wondering, by you endorsing Panama and moving down there, isn't it really just postponing the inevitable? It seems like eventually they're going to take over everywhere. Well, I don't know where else to go. Um, uh, my associate, Clarence Malcolm, has done a lot of research on it, and he feels that this is the safest place to go. We've already put uh, money down on a, a rental, rent to buy in the mountains, and uh, you know, if it doesn't work out there, we'll go someplace else. I have pretty good instincts, and if things uh, eat up in Panama, uh, believe me, I'll end up going someplace and won't, I won't hang around. Thank you again for your courage. Thank you. Could you please comment on our senators, on our, on our senators and congressmen, those who are clueless, how many of us, or what percentage are clueless, and how many are involved? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, back in the 1980s, I was asked to go back to Nebraska to work on the Franklin cover-up case. <clears throat> uh, the, um, it was learned that the Franklin Savings and Loan, which was set up for minorities in Omaha, thank you, sir, for coming. <clears throat> um, it was learned that uh, $40 million was missing. So the Senate, State Senate, John DeCamp and Lauren Schmidt came in. And first of all, the FBI raided it and all that sort of thing. And uh, there was newspaper publicity. And 80 children came forward because of the pictures in the paper said, Mommy, that man molested me, right? And they were talking about a fellow named Larry King, not uh, Larry King Live, but a, a black man, a rising star in the Republican Party. So um, there was a big investigation, and it led to uh, satanic cults. Uh, people involved were the chief of police, Bob Wadman, Omaha, um, and uh, Harold Anderson, past publisher of the Omaha World Herald. And Eugene Mahoney had the Nebraska Forestry Service, and it was who's who in the city of Omaha. <clears throat> and also what was developed was that they were taking they, meaning the cult, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <coughs> I have sinus training. They were taking children out of uh, Boys Town orphanages and foster homes and driving them to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles away, placing them in private jets, flying them to Washington, D.C. for sex orgies with Congress and senators and dignitaries. And I've covered that in my intelligence report, by the way. So uh, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> a guy named Rusty Nelson was taking pictures of them while they were doing this sort of thing. And uh, Rusty uh, would take a picture of them for them because they kept track of the film. And then he would sneak his own film in because he figured he'd need insurance down the road, and he was right. And uh, so he had these pictures uh, of these dignitaries who were involved in these nefarious sexual activities. Congressman Senators, as I said. Now, uh, Rusty uh, was asked to participate in a sexual act with a man, and he, didn't, he wasn't any part of that. So he went out a bathroom window in a motel and made his way back to Norfolk, Nebraska, 
and his granddad had an old farm there that was abandoned and he stayed on the farm for a while and the f b i came around to rusty parents and the mother very naively said all rusty's over at such and such a farm house the f b i went over and interviewed rusty at the farm house and rusty says it's time to take off and he took off of course now before this happened during the investigation gary care doria gary care dora was a investigator for the senate committee schmidt and uh... de camp and he made contact with rusty rusty was in arizona and rusty said meet me in chicago he didn't want to meet gary care dora in phoenix and so he met him in chicago gary did and uh... rusty turned over the pictures of him having sex with some of the dignitaries in washington dc senators congressmen so on white house people okay use your own imagination gary care dory made the mistake of calling lauren schmidt i have the smoking gun he had his own airplane and that night after the all-star game he had his eleven year old twelve year old boy with him they got in gary's plane and over aurora illinois the plane exploded gary died uh... pictures were all over the place first person at the scene was a sheriff deputy sheriff he picked up the pictures the fbi agent came along grabbed the picture and said keep your mouth shut uh... he apparently didn't keep his mouth shut because a, um, a, a year later his wife was murdered by the way the farmer said that he saw an explosion and the government said that uh... that the plane just fell apart okay. the rear seat was never recovered the, uh, Gary Caradoy's briefcase was never recovered, and the pictures, who knows what the FBI did with that. <clears throat> I did everything I could to get my hands on that airplane, and I was going to have it examined by a forensic specialist, because if there was a bomb on that plane, a forensic expert could tell you that there was a bomb, and they can classify the bomb. I couldn't get the plane, because it was being held in a military base. Now, why would the military take a plane being flown by a civilian and take control of it? Cover up, no question about it. But uh, anyway, that's uh, of the number back there. If I had to guess, just from my research and my experience, I'd say maybe 35 good people back there, including Ron Paul. 35 out of a whole bunch. That's senators, senators and congressmen. That's what I would guess. I, you know, I'd have no way of knowing, but I know that. Well, look, look, look how they've been voting. I look at them, look at them voting. On, they voted to extend the Patriot Act to make parts of the Patriot Act uh, permanent. So that that brings up a second question. Can, it's so big, and it is it is has so many tentacles and so many and so many parts of the government and the military and uh, corporations. How did it get like this? Do you have you've been thinking about this for a long time. I've only known about this for the past couple of years. I wonder if you could put it in perspective somehow. Well, I've been involved in research in this for 30 years. And uh, piece by piece, it, it fell in, in certain, in order, you know? First this, this, and this. I was given a lecture in the late 90s, 90, probably middle 90s in uh, Las Vegas. And after the lecture, a fellow came up with, to me and handed me his book, Pawns in the Game. And he said, this is what it's all about. And I didn't know anything about Pawns in the Game. I knew very little about the Illuminati. Pawns in the Game is available through me, by the way. And I urge you to buy it. That and the Franklin cover-up book by John DeCamp. And uh, these are both the most dynamite, powerful books that I've ever read. And that's how I learned about the Illuminati. I mean, I'd heard about them, but I really knew about them after that. I learned about the 25 goals that take over the world. And it got so big, and it goes so well organized, that I can move, I can go from Los Angeles tonight to Nebraska and have a surveillance on me and have somebody come into my house in Nebraska or here in L.A. I've had surveillances on me in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Ohio, Utah, uh, California, Oregon. I mean, they've got a network of people out of an army. It's army. 
And what it is is primarily, primarily military intelligence. Remember, Eisenhower warned us about military industrial complex. Remember? He knew. Jack Kennedy knew. And uh, you have to take your hat, hat off to him. I don't want to take my hat off. I don't show him any respect. But you have to take your hat off to him. They are well organized. But they've been doing it for 230 some years. Since uh, 1773. Yeah. Mr. Steve. Ted, uh, isn't the CFR part of this conspiracy? Oh, of course. Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Trilateral Commission, uh, the Masons. There's a lot of good Masons out there. You know what they do? They look you over, and only when you get at the very highest level do they make, do you realize that what they're part of the conspiracy at that highest, highest level. That was one of the 25 goals, to take over the secret society, the Masons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, unbelievable. Would you please uh, review the circumstances regarding the death of William Cooper? Uh, Bill Cooper, uh, I, had, I had conversations with Bill. You, you folks know who Bill Cooper was? He was the Patriot. He was a Patriot, uh, like me. He, was, he wrote uh, Behold the Pale Horse, as I recall. Isn't that what the book he wrote, Ed? Right. Dennis, yeah. And uh, he was out public giving speeches and so forth. I talked to him on the phone every once in a while. And uh, he was, uh, the government, the, the sheriff's office claims that he came out on the front porch with a gun and so on and so forth, and they blew him away. Uh, I question that. I don't think Bill was stupid enough to come out with a gun with the wife of Strano with a bunch of deputy sheriffs. But there's no witnesses, just like Gordon Call. Uh, you already called serving life in prison uh, over the gun battle they had with the U.S. Marshals. And uh, look at uh, Gary Webb. Gary Webb was uh, suicided. You know what that means, suicide. He didn't commit, he didn't commit suicide. He shot himself in the head twice. <laughs> okay? Uh, the uh, Danny Casalero. Danny Casalero was writing a book about the very thing I've been telling you about tonight, about the shadow government. And they came into his hotel in Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, as a matter of fact, Danny called me about a week before he went to, on this trip. And uh, they murdered him. They said he committed suicide. He did. There was, there was blood transfers on the towel. You know blood transfers is where there was, if, if, you, if you have a crime and if the blood just happens to be there, but if there's a towel or something, you wipe it, that's called blood transfer. There was a towel with blood transfer on it in the bathroom. They said he, I think he slid his wrist. They said he slid his wrist in the bathtub or something. But he's Catholic, and he left a note for his son. And I understand I'm not Catholic, but I understand you're Catholic. If you commit suicide, you don't go to heaven. That's their belief, right? And in the note, he said, don't worry, son, I'll go to heaven. It was a subliminal message. They're good at they're good at subliminal messages too, by the way. Any other questions? Yeah, there we go. USC, good old USC, huh? Right on. Right on, USC. Um, how much do you know about the Federal Reserve? I'm getting uh, mixed uh, uh, intelligence about it. Uh, supposedly, twelve families run the Federal Reserve like they've run the uh, central banks in Europe. And I heard that uh, basically they print money out of thin air and charge discount to our government, charges interest in our own money, and use the personal income tax to pay for that so-called national debt back to those families, which have never been audited. And also, the central banks of Europe, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, they're all controlled by the, the same outfit, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergs, the Bohemian Grove, uh, you know, the uh, Freemasons and all, all that, the Royal Institute in, in England and things like that. But uh, getting back to that, is that, is that correct, basically? Yes. They control and own the Federal Reserve, and they print the money up. And the Federal they, Reserve, not Federal. Yeah, I'm aware of that. They were the Federal Express. And I think there's 12 families that really basically run the world, the Windsors, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, uh, and some others. I think there's question. four American families that are involved in the Federal Reserve, four families. The rest are all Europeans, mm -hmm. English. 
and there's 12 districts of the Federal Reserve, and what they do is they just print money out thin air and they just charge. They charge yeah. the, the, the uh, U.S. Treasury Department, uh, they charge, I think, three cents a bill, whether it's a $1 bill or a $100 bill. And then the Federal Reserve can take that $100 bill that they paid three cents for and loan it out ten times. Uh, second question. John Kennedy was printing greenbacks back in 1962. He was well aware that, even though he was a member of the Boston chapter of the Council on Foreign Relations, from my understanding, uh, one of the reasons he was killed was that he wanted to abolish the Federal Reserve, put it back in the hands of the Treasury. Uh, the second thing was that he want, had plans to pull out of Vietnam in 1965 because he knew it was a bogus war. And the people that really run things actually create communism, financed uh, communism, uh, and Prescott Bush was involved by, you know, the, uh, the idiot's uh, grandfather. And, uh, huh. and he was deeply involved with the, uh, the, the Illuminati and things like that and the backing mm -hmm. of Hitler and, and uh, so forth. That's right. Well, thank you. That's right. Um, there was a point I was going to make about, I forget, anyway. Uh, no, of Jack Kennedy. He was also going to dismantle and revamp the CIA. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? And he was killed by... The CIA of Chicago mob, Sam Giancana, Sam Giancana. was uh, to testify for Congress three days before he testified he was murdered. It's just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. Yeah, but there are a lot of them. There's a, plenty of them. I had a case in uh, the Jeffrey Digman case. It's not well known, but the father called me, Bill Digman, and his wife Lois, beautiful people. Jeff was a captain in the Marine Corps in San Diego. Was that Camp Pendleton down there? And he was in charge of a drug task force to investigate uh, drugs on the base. And he was murdered. And the, the Naval Intelligence came in and said he committed suicide. And the family hired me to put the case together to prove otherwise. Mm -hmm. And he was shot on the, he, they said he was shot on the bed. Now, there was blood transfer in that instance, as I explained that to you. And, had, and he was supposed to be sitting on the bed, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, like this is the head of the bed, this is the, the foot of the bed, right? He was laying back like this, mm -hmm. in the middle of the bed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he was shot, he was left-handed, but the bullet went from the right skull to the left, right? Entry mm -hmm. here, exit here. Yeah. Now, if he's sitting on the bed, where's the bullet hole going to be in the ceiling? Yeah. Over here, right? Mm -hmm. You know where the bullet hole was? Over here, Ooh. behind him. Ooh. So what I did is I, the family hired me, and I went to the scene, Naval Intelligence showed up, and I opened up the ceiling where the bullet hole was and ran a, a wire from there across the, the room, which would be the trajectory of the bullet, yeah. right? Yeah. And had he been sitting on the bed, the trajectory of the bullet was 10 inches above his head. Ooh. And the father, of course, they wanted that suicide label taken off of it, taken out of the Naval Intelligence. They finally, the military finally said, uh, 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 death unknown, cause of death unknown. Yeah. Yeah. So he was under another drug murder. And Sable, Colonel Sable, uh, you're probably familiar with that case, another drug, uh, General OMP in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, back in the 80s. He was responsible for the largest successful drug raid in the history of the Army. And he was working in his office late one night. He had a habit of doing this. And he heard a noise outside. He wrote a little note and put it in his desk. I hear a noise, strange noise. He went outside. The next morning they found him. He was hung. And his uniform was very neatly laid next to him. And uh, they said he committed suicide. He was murdered. Hmm. Obviously murdered. He didn't hang himself. And uh, the word I have, he was murdered by one of the people that participated in the Jeffrey McDonald case. Ooh. Remember the guy named Eddie? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Eddie. Yes. I was wondering if you uh, were aware of uh, any of the doings surrounding Flight 800 that apparently was shot down uh, because the, the FBI came in and had some very, very strange involvement with this that appeared to... Uh, uh, completely cover it up and dismiss the witnesses completely. The people in Long Island, New York, the FBI agents would have coffee. They were working on the case. Mm -hmm. And they told the natives there, hey, it's a cover-up. 
He was shot. He was shot down. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a, a pour wine in the cockpit or the gas tank or something. Right. And uh, so uh, you know, there's it, another cover up. Mm-hmm. Another cover up. Looks like we better not be reporting anything that we're well, involved in. Remember the Egyptian eh? airline? Egyptian airline? Yes, I never did hear the story on that. Well, I, I, what I think happened, and the reason I think it happened is because T- Jack Kennedy Jr. had the same experience there. The Egyptian airline went straight down. I think that what happened is that he was a mind control, the co pilot was a mind control victim. And I think that was his assignment, because there were some high ranking Egyptian officers on that airplane. Okay, now Jack Kennedy Jr. Uh, he left and went to Martha's Vineyard, and uh, he his regular instructor, who we flew with, <coughs> was not available. <coughs> and he spent 45 minutes in the uh, at the airport trying to line up another instructor. Mm-hmm. He finally lined up another instructor who went with him. He'd never been with that instructor before. Mm-hmm. The plane came in on radar and went straight down. Okay, yeah. just before Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. The government couldn't find the plane for five hours, right? Mm-hmm. And when they did find the plane, the seat was missing. The, the instructor would have been sitting in. Mm-hmm. And what I suspect happened is the reason they didn't find the plane for five hours is because the instructor was a mind control victim, hmm. MK Ultra, which is came over with Operation Paperclip, it's in this report, and they found that the control for the fuel to the engines had been turned off. Yeah. And there's a very good DVD out that's available through me on the death of Jack Jr. You, you know about that? Yes, I do. Okay. And he was going to run against Hillary for the Senate in New York City, New York State. Uh-huh. And you think that he would have been elected? Yes. You think he'd be presidential candidate today? Yes. yes. And I think he'd beat out one of our presidents. He would have been a president. But they couldn't afford to have Jack Jr. be a president. Nope. At the time of Jack Kennedy Sr., I didn't think he was much of a president. But now I look back, I think he's one of the greatest presidents yeah. we've had. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ted. By the way, uh, Ted, you I, I haven't read your whole report, and you may have it in there, but uh, Jack Kennedy was also aware of and you know, was totally disgusted with the uh, report that recently was declassified, the Operation Norwood. Uh, do you, do you, uh, can you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, op- Operation Norwood was, um, uh, they were going to commit a terrorist act and blame it on, was it the Cubans? Cuba, uh, uh, Castro, uh, yeah. The Cubans had tried it, but the same thing happened with the Gulf of Tonkin. Northwood. Northwood, that's it. Northwood. That's what we said, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, because it, it involved a lot of detailed things, and one of them, was, of course, was uh, shooting down an airline and replacing it, you know, with a, a fake one, and but and then, uh, you know, blaming it, obviously, on Cuba, on uh, Castro. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're good at that. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember if you have given out your website and the procedure for getting your DVDs. You it's free via mail.com. Free via mail.com. It's on the card back there. And the website for the multi-level program is worldlightfunding.net slash Ted Gunderson. And my regular website, uh, tedgunderson.com, is down because my second webmaster I mentioned, he was set up on a phony child molestation charge, uh, Chris Jones, and he was sentenced last April, as a matter of fact. And uh, he went off, and he, I haven't been able to get the username and the details from him, and he seems to have forgotten it, and I'm having trouble getting it back up, and it ran out. So you, you, I'm going to reactivate it very shortly. Yes, sir? Yeah. Uh, I just have a few questions. You look like Santa Claus, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hope, hope, uh, get up on the mic. Like, I don't feel like him, though. <laughs> uh, my question is I have to. Up to the mic. Uh, I've got to. Uh, the upshot of the economic crisis, uh, my understanding is uh, we have this idea about this North American Union coming in in 2010. And uh, these, this 
these things that are going to happen is a restructuring of, of all our state's borders to, to mirror the European Union. Uh, that's my, my first question. I wonder if you could comment on that. The other one is, a couple of weeks ago there was an aircraft accident back east, and a lady named Beverly Eckhart was on the plane whose husband was killed in 911. Now, she had, the day before, had a meeting with President Obama. And uh, it was kind of unusual for someone with her Did she survive? No, no, she did not. And I wonder if you've heard What's her name again? Beverly Eckhart, I believe. Eckhart. Mm -hmm. She was one of the, a widow of a man who passed in uh, 911. And apparently, she was very outspoken. Pardon? She represented yeah, the whole group. She yeah. represented the whole group, so she had a lot of information. Uh, I, I don't know, they didn't tell what the, was discussed between the president and her, but it was kind of unusual for her. That's another, you know, almost beyond your imagination, beyond a, being a coincidence. They're good at their airplane crashes. That's one of their specialties. Okay. So yeah. the, uh, the North American Union, hey, what is, uh, oh, excuse me, the North American Union, do you think that uh, this is the bottom line? They want to bring this in, change our state's borders, and make us more in line with European. Uh, yeah, definitely. The North American Union. And of course, uh, we signed a pact with Canada, too. I said that they amend, uh, repealed that uh, agreement with Canada you know, to, to mend, to uh, mold U.S. troops and Canadian troops. Did they repeal that? No, that's still active. Huh? In the event of, quote, civil unrest. The Amero, the yeah, the Amero, yeah, yeah. And yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank for, you. I mean, for everything. Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, uh, I have a, f a friend of mine that uh, has known you over the years, and they always speak so highly of you and your courage, and just your testimony in this life uh, is, you know, it's just an inspiration. Well, I've got a lot of people fooled, okay? Well, I don't like to, I know there's a fear there, and this stuff scares all of us because it changes so fast. I believe that technology is the, the culprit. It's made things so easily taken care of. Uh, I'm kind of a, beginning to be a student of the last Civil War and uh, how they could easily... Uh, changed the rules. This is the Civil War years ago we had. And I had people, my relatives and family, you know, they were on both sides and they died for what was freedom. And uh, I'm a veteran too of Vietnam and uh, I have friends of mine and uh, it seems as if we have really taken a cavalier attitude toward our own history of what real life is all about because we, we focus in on our technologies is so quickly. And I would suggest that the way to protect ourselves from these entities who abuse that technology by uh, subliminal mind control or television is just don't buy into it. If you don't play, you don't pay. Uh, the Mexicans have a saying, en boca cerrada no entran moscas. A closed mouth draws no flies. But as long as you've got your agenda ready to go, and you know where you're headed, and you know that you can have uh, uh, set your goals in your life on a higher, greater power that's the creator of the whole everything, you're going to be fine. Uh, I believe in there's a God, and God is going to take care of us. If it wasn't a God, I wouldn't be here, believe me. Amen to that. All the things I've been through. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for coming. Yes. Gentlemen, speak into the mic now. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming, Mr. Gunnison. I just uh, was wondering... You know, um, what are your, uh, what do you think of the, uh, uh, you know, plane crash with John Kennedy Jr. and, you know, your network of uh, people, um, you know, that deal with your kind of work, uh, what did they think of it uh, at the time of, uh, you know, at the time that it happened and the way the uh, family disposed of the body? Well, I smelled a skunk immediately. And then uh, I saw the uh, DVD about Jack Kennedy Jr. and it's very well documented. It's one of the best DVDs I've ever seen. 
And there's a DVD out about Jack Kennedy Sr.'s assassination, too, that's excellent. And they claim there were 13 shots at the Mdeley Plaza that day. But that's available. You know, like we said, Jack Jr. would have been running for the Senate in New York, and I think he would have been a presidential candidate. Yes. Yes, I have a question about George Bush Jr. I found some information about him on the web. I found it on a couple of places, but I can't find details, and I thought maybe you could fill in the blanks. And that was that before his political career, when he was still – before he got into politics at all, he was missing for three days when 17 Satanists in southern Texas were killed and skinned. Seventeen what? Seventeen Satanists were killed and skinned, and that when he reappeared, he was suspect number one, prime suspect, and that he was held by the police until his daddy pulled some strings. You said 17 Satanists? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is what I found on the – They claim that he did it or what? I don't know what his involvement was. And I thought – I never heard that story. Okay. I never heard that story, yeah. But it was on the web one time. You know, it could not be true. If you go to the web and check me out, you'll find out I was kicked out of the FBI for practicing satanic ceremony in the Federal Building. So Stu Webb says – yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on Sonny Bono and his untimely demise? Sonny – Bob Fletcher deserves a medal. Bob Fletcher has a number of DVDs out. And he had documentation, as many of us do, about CIA drug operations. And he had been in touch with Sonny Bono's administrative assistant. And also, after a short period of time, Sonny Bono himself, personally. And Sonny Bono was getting ready to go on a vacation, winter vacation. And he said that as soon as he gets back from his skiing trip, he would issue subpoenas and get to the bottom of the CIA drug operation. He was found like 125 feet off the ski run near a tree. He had five abrasions on his left side of his head. It looked like somebody with a gun had beat him. His mask was gone. His eye – his – what do they call them? Eye goggles were gone. And he had three layers of clothing on. And there was a cut in the back. And there was so much blood that bled through – so much blood that bled through all three layers into his back. And what I think happened – there was more than one person there. And he got a good – maybe an elbow into the nose or the face of the fellow who was bleeding. He was trying to hold him from behind while they were beating on him. He was a bludgeon to death. And, of course, they couldn't shoot him. That would be too obvious. But Bob Fletcher was the one that did the investigation on it. It was mentioned in Globe magazine. And they asked me my comments on it. And so I was also mentioned in Globe magazine in connection with his death. And – Drug operation. I do believe a couple weeks back on a Sunday night – I might be wrong on the day – it was – Bob Fletcher was on George Norrie. You can go to Coast to Coast and look up the last time Bob Fletcher was on Coast to Coast. And the whole thing – a lot of it was on the murder of Sonny Bono. So you can – you can get copies of that. Yeah. No, Bob did a great job on it. People kind of think that I had something to do with the investigation. Bob thought maybe I was trying to – what's it? You jump on his bandwagon. I wasn't. It just happened to – Globe magazine calls me regularly and asks for my opinion on cases. And – because I am an expert on reconstructing the crime scene and analyzing crime scenes. Yeah, you have to go through Bob Fletcher. I handled him for a while. He said he wants to handle him himself. So get a hold of Bob Fletcher. Tell him I referred you to him. Yeah, here's Mr. Norwegian, my Norwegian buddy. You got that right. How long do you think it is before they start this road all the way through Canada from Mexico? Before they start the road? The what? The road, the international, whatever. Oh, they've already started it. They're building it now. But the people in Texas have been able to block it, I guess, coming into Texas. 
uh, and make any progress in that part of the country. It's going to divide the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they have roads going in all different directions from the main road, too. I think it comes up right through Kansas City, doesn't it, Wendy? Yeah, and they're going to take over all the property that belongs to all the farmers and everything. That's a buffer, just like the just like the forests, uh, or uh, just like the Communist Manifesto. They grab up everything. Well, they did that with the freeways. They kicked everybody out, you know, when they built the freeways. And then they got somebody told me they just finished a big, huge uh, internment camp in Montana. A huge what? A big camp, you know. Uh, camp? Yeah, for people. Oh yeah, they got they got a thousand camps around the country. A thousand, yeah. Thank you. Know, you. Internment camps, yeah. Okay, I guess, listen, folks, uh, make sure you get all my material back there. If you want to leave a little donation to cover the photocopy work, I'd appreciate it. And see you all next trip. like to thank uh, Ted Gunderson for this incredible lecture and the audience participation. So we'd like to give him one more round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Gunderson. Ted. Our next one will be in April, the first Thursday with Dr. Stanley Monteith. And you can go to Radio Liberty and my website for further information. Thank you so much and God bless. And may we come back next time for another assembly at the Granada Forum. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's amazing, guys, how much longer we're really going to have. I don't know. So every time we get to meet, it's a blessing. You, you think maybe we would have had three or four hundred people here? But uh, hey, uh, yeah, we have a, a nice lady here. Wants to know. Um, how mind control and the airwaves and how they affect us. I think Ted could probably answer that too. Is um, Jack, are you, do you have any interest in this one, Jack? Ted, real quick. Um, do, you, do you know how the mind control through the airwaves, how it's affecting us? I know they're using, I, knew, I know they're using the chemtrails. Uh, they're shooting uh, beams down from the satellites. And, uh, my place in uh, Claytonia, there's no, absolutely no question about it. I mean, we can feel them at night, 1.32 o'clock in the morning. The satellite passes over, and what they've done is they, they've zeroed in on our particular location with these satellite beams, and, and it, it affects our health. Well, it can't help but affect the mind to a degree. I mean, I think I'm okay so far, but, you know, I think in the long run it's going to affect the mind. Yeah, well, they're dropping poison on us from chemtrails. That's heavy metal stuff they're putting into your body. Now, the story I've got on, on the chemtrails is they're putting heavy metal in us. We have DNA, right? And through the heavy metal in us and our DNA, they'll be able to keep track of us any place in the world. 